Okay, so the next molecule that we're going to take a look at is a little bit more complicated, and its molecular formula is C5H10O2. Okay, so just like with the other two examples, the first thing that we have to do is to figure out our degrees of unsaturation. And so for this molecule, the degrees of unsaturation are going to equal 5 carbon atoms minus 10 hydrogens divided by 2. And then we don't have any nitrogens or halogens, so the last and final step is to just add 1. So that's going to equal 5 minus 5 plus 1. And so obviously these cancel, and our final du count is going to equal 1. So 1 is going to be the number of degrees of unsaturation. So the next thing that we're going to do is just to take a look at all of the spectral data. So just like before, we'll label each peak with a letter. So peak A uh, shows up at around 1.2 ppm. It shows up as 3 with, as its integration, and it shows up as a triplet for its splitting pattern. Okay. Peak B is going to show up at just a little bit farther downfield at 1.3 dot, and it's going to have an integration of 3, and it's also going to be another triplet. So we have a third peak, so peak C is going to show up at 2.3 ppm. It integrates to two protons and it shows up as a quartet. And then finally, our fourth and final peak is going to be peak D, and it's going to show up at around 4.1, integrates to two protons, and it's also going to be a quartet. So now that we've written out all of our data, let's try to figure out the most probable structure for each uh, peak. So for peak A, it integrates to three protons, so the most likely structure is going to be a methyl group. Peak B shows up again with an integration of three, so it's more than likely going to be represented by a second CH3 group. Peak C integrates to two, and so we're probably looking at a methylene group. And finally, for peak D, it shows up with an integration of two, so we've got yet another CH2. Okay, so just like with the other two examples, the next thing that we want to do is to make sure that we've accounted for all of our atoms in our molecule. So let's go ahead and count up all of the carbons that we've drawn out so far. So we have one, two, three, four carbons, and when we look back at our original molecular formula, we should have five. So what that is telling us is that we'll probably have some kind of carbon with no hydrogens on it, so that could either be this kind of quaternary carbon, or we could also have this carbonyl group, which is a possibility since if you look back up at your degrees of unsaturation, you could have one degree of unsaturation, which could take into account a carbonyl group. So it's either this or that. Now, of course, we we'll want to take a look at our molecular formula and make sure that we have an oxygen, and in this case, we do have two oxygens to work with, so that makes it even more likely, obviously, to have the carbonyl. Okay, so let's take a look at our proton count. So we have three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so we have ten hydrogens in our molecular formula, so that's now taken care of. Now the only thing that we have to really worry about now are our oxygens. Now with the oxygens, this could be a little bit tricky, so remember we have two oxygens and we have to figure out what are the possibilities. Now, we can either have this kind of configuration where we have an R group, we'll just call it our prime, and then we have an oxygen, and then there's another R group off of the oxygen. Okay. Now one way to take uh, into account both of the oxygens in the molecular formula is that we could have two times this number of kind of functionality. So this would be an ether functionality or an ester functionality, but for now we'll just draw it generically as R prime O and then let's just say R. Now that's one way that we can take care of two of the oxygens. The second way that we can take care of two of the oxygens is if we have, let's say, one kind of ether functionality like above, so this type of ether functionality, plus we could also have uh, a carbonyl, like how we've drawn in the yellow up and to the left right here. So we could have um, two ether functionalities, or we could have an ether with a ketone. It could also be an ester type of functionality. We're not sure yet. Or we have one other possibility. We could have, let's say, two 
carbonyl groups. Now, one would be tempted to include this in the mix, but then when we take a look back up above with our degrees of unsaturation, remember that we only have one degree of unsaturation. So having two carbonyl groups is not a possibility. Okay, so let's just go ahead and subdivide this up a little bit more. Uh, so we'll go ahead and say we have three possibilities here, but really the two carbonyl case isn't really a possibility. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete that guy, make it easier on ourselves. Okay, so we really only have two possibilities for the oxygens. Okay, so this whole bit a little bit farther to the right over in this area has the potential to get really complicated really quickly. So let's just push this off to the side for a moment and focus more on the NMR data that we have at hand. So let's take a look at PKA. Now, PKA is again, more than likely a methyl group. So let's just go ahead and draw this down here. Now, let's take a look at the splitting pattern. So PKA is a triplet. Now, that, if you remember, that means that CH3 has two vicinal hydrogens next to it. So we'll draw another methyl or um, carbon atom with two protons. So, and this carbon has some other group. We're not sure what. Now, again, how did I know that there were two protons vicinal to the protons from PK? Uh, remember, again, that this is a triplet. So the, the splitting pattern tells you exactly how many protons are vicinal. So since this is a triplet, um, peak A should have two vicinal protons. So these are the protons on peak A. And you see here's one vicinal proton and here's the other vicinal proton. So two vicinal protons will show up as a triplet. Now just to keep track of everything, let's go ahead and label this methyl group as peak A. Okay. Now let's take a look at peak B. Peak B is very similar to peak A. The only real, the only thing that's really different is the chemical shift. So by the exact same rationale, the groups that are around that are around peak B should have the exact same form as this ethyl group. So we're basically just going to draw another ethyl group. Okay. So just like this is a uh, peak A, and I. Uh, designated that here, this is peak B, and the protons associated with peak B. And just like before, because peak B shows up as a triplet, we should have two vicinal protons, so I'll draw an arrow from the protons associated with peak B to the two vicinal protons, here and here. Okay, let's go ahead and draw a box again around all of our puzzle pieces like so. Here are all the potential puzzle pieces that we have to work with. And we're just going to go ahead and cross off the ones that we've already used. So we've already used uh, this methyl group here, and we've already used this methyl group associated with peak B. That should have been purple. So that is used. Okay, so... If you look below, you see that we have two methyl methylene groups here and here, and there should be two methylene groups associated with peak C and peak D. So we can just go ahead and effectively cross those off because we've already used them, because we, because we already know that they're right beside the methyl groups. So we'll just go ahead and cross them off. So at this point, we need to take a look at this uh, quaternary carbon possibility. So again, we can either have this quaternary carbon or we could have uh, a carbonyl group. So at this point, I'm just going to make an, or, or, uh, an educated guess. Because of the fact that we have one degree of unsaturation, uh, I'm going to go ahead and guess, and that degree of unsaturation is going to be taken up by a carbonyl group. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the carbonyl group down below here. And notice that as soon as I've chosen the carbonyl possibility, this, go ahead, this goes ahead and, um, and eliminates this possibility of having two ether groups up above. So that means that we're now left with the, poss the only other possibility, which is having this carbonyl group combined with some type of ether group. So by now, it should, um, it should be a little bit more obvious that now that we've gotten rid of this carbonyl group here and here, the only other possibility of where to put the oxygen is, let's say, right beside the the carbonyl, and at this point, if we draw it this way, we have an ester. And now that we've drawn the ester, since the only other possibilities we have are these two ethyl groups, or the other two pieces that we have left to deal with are these ethyl groups, we can simply attach them to both ends. So there's a CH2 here, 
and then the other part of the ethyl group is the CH3. So that's uh, attributed to this piece of the puzzle. So we'll go ahead and knock that guy out. And then the final part is just to attach the other ethyl group. So we have a CH2 right here. And then finally, uh, your methyl group right here. So here's the other um, ethyl group. So we'll go ahead and knock this guy out. And so at this point, it should be pretty obvious what the final molecule should look like. So it should look like this ethyl group right here with an ester and then another ethyl group. So that's the structure of your final molecule. But the question you should be asking yourself is, well, which methylene group is C and which methylene group is D? And that question is very, easy, uh, very easily answered by taking a look at the chemical shift. So if we look at the chemical shift for D, we'll see that it has a chemical shift of around 4.1, which is much more downfield than the chemical shift for P C. So peak D, or the protons for peak D, should be in a much more electronegative environment than the methylene protons for peak C. So if we take a look, we have two um, chemical environments right here and right here for the two protons for the methylene groups. So I'll go ahead and draw out the two protons on each carbon. So here are the two protons for that methylene group and here are the two protons for the other methylene group. Now these protons are immediately adjacent to an oxygen whereas these two protons are immediately adjacent to a carbonyl group. The oxygen is going to be much more electronegative than the carbonyl group. So we can say this is more electronegative. And so that means these protons are peak D. And these protons up here are from peak C. So we'll just redraw these as peak C right there. And these are peak D. And give it that last little arrow. And this is indeed the correct structure.